I'm Adam Dilley. I lead uh, product engineering at Quantum Metric, and uh, this topic is actually a great way to, to describe what we do. For the last 10 years, for some of the most recognizable brands in the, in the world, we've been connecting the dots between user satisfaction and revenue, and we do it with data. So we let you go prove that improving user experience is going to drive the bottom line for the company. Um, this topic, I'm excited because I sat here on the same stage last year, and we talked about team. We talked about uh, you know, driving product knowledge across the organization, which is great. It's really important building a team. I love building teams. I love my team. Uh, I think the fact that we have revenue in this topic this year is so telling about the, the economy in the last year. It's been you know, it's tough on a lot of us, but I think it's so healthy that we're here to talk about building healthy businesses and not just um, kind of some of our sometimes fluffy topics in, in a product world. We got to build a great team, build a great user experience, but do it for the purpose of building a great business. So I'm excited about today. You sure? Took some. Hey guys, I'm Joe Crawford, VP of Professional Services at Glassbox. Uh, Glassbox is a digital experience intelligence platform used to monitor 100% of your customers' data, uh, the user sessions, user interactions, client feedback. We take that data to produce user insi insights into your user experience, the customer journey, and helps you to understand your product effectiveness. Um, I, you know, like Adam, I'm really excited to be here today. I think this is a great topic. It's relevant. You can take what we, what we talk about here and apply it immediately uh, when you go back. So thank you for having me. Awesome. Well, first of all, I've got to say, Scott, we're happy you're here at all, given the weather <laughs> <Great>. Dallas. <laughs> Lucky to be here from Dallas. <laughs> Lucky to get out, one of the few. Uh, I'm Scott Harper. I'm the CEO and one of the two co-founders of Dialexa. We are a product engineering firm. Uh, we help our clients actually design, architect, engineer, custom technology solutions. Um, we primarily focus on large enterprises, um, mainly the non-digital native community. Uh, we've also worked with a lot of uh, growth companies and startups as well, though. Um, We've built products across pretty much every sector you can think of, from the automotive space, bringing, um, bringing car subscriptions to market. We've worked with large medical device companies uh, on blood glucose monitoring solutions, all the way to on the enterprise side, uh, working with large hospital and health ecosystems to try to bring great experiences to all of us as patients, instead of having to interact with 20 different systems, bring into a single, you know, great user experience, uh, single platform. So um, really happy to be here. Very happy to be talking about this topic as well. The revenue side, something we're really passionate about. Great. Thanks. Yeah. And Rahul? I'm Rahul Jain. I'm one of the co-founders of Pendo, but I've, every um, startup has a utility worker. So I've done everything from finance to customer success and back into product org now, building all our expansion products. So Pendo is really built for product managers. It's a platform that does everything from understanding how your customers are using your product with analytics, how do you drive adoption with in-app guidance, but also listening to your customers with getting feedback, NPS, and then building empathy with session replays. So it's really a platform that helps product managers drive a better experience and elevate that experience for the end users. Which is a perfect segue then. <laughs> into the, ultimately the question we're here to talk about of user satisfaction and revenue. Does one actually drive the other? And what are the most critical areas that you've seen this impact? We can work our way down. Yeah, when we were, when we were chatting about this, I, I, I felt like, isn't this just a question that's like obvious? You know, like does user satisfaction drive revenue? For me, the easiest way to think about it is, who, what's the company that I love to give my money to? Um, a non-charitable company that I love to give my money to. Um, and when we think about those, it's normally a company that's we're really satisfied with either product or service that they're offering. And a, a quick story that just happened yesterday, I think, to illustrate this. I, I was on the way here. I realized in the morning yesterday that the schedule we would have today would get me here at some ungodly early hour. <laughs> Colorado time, that would be like 3.30, you know. And... Um, I realized because of that, I need to get here earlier. I need to change my flight and move it, move it to earlier in the day. And United made it so easy for me. I hopped on the app. It showed me all the flights that I could choose from to change to. It showed me all the seed maps, the standby list, so I knew kind of what I was going to be working with. And um, it gave me reassurance that when I picked a standby flight, 
I would be able to keep my original schedule. I wasn't going to miss out on that original flight that I had booked. Worst case, I'd be keeping my original plan. Um, so I get to the airport, and I get to the gate. My name's up on the screen. Talk to the gate agent. She figures out my last name. She's like, yeah, Mr. Dilly, I've been working on uh, seats for you. I was lucky enough to be able to bring my whole family to this trip. It's the first time I've ever brought my whole family on a, on a business trip. And she said, I've got your three kids together in three seats in row 27. You and your wife are only one seat or one row apart on the same side of the plane. How does that sound? I'm like, amazing. <laughs> I mean, it was a perfect experience. Two minutes later, I'm in the line getting on the plane, and I get here, you know, more hours to sleep, to have more energy for all of you. And at the end of that, you know, I was thinking, I've never flown standby. I've, I've been flying for years, and I've never flown standby, and I was apprehensive to do it. But they kind of guided me through the whole thing, made me drop all those worries. And now I'm more likely to do it in the future. I'm more likely to spend money, again, with United, because they made that experience great. That's me being a satisfied customer, connected to probably some future revenue for United because of it. So it just follows that increasing user satisfaction is going to drive bottom line for the company. Absolutely. Particularly interesting when you're already part of that loyalty network and somewhat invested in that brand yeah. where they yeah. may not need to, they may not feel the need to go that mm -hmm. extra mile, but they did. And therefore, the yeah. long-term relationship will be all the yeah. stronger. Absolutely. Joe, how do you see this? Yeah, it's, it's same, you know, I think there's a strong correlation between user satisfaction and, um, and increased revenue. Um, you know, obviously, studies show that if, you know, customers are satisfied, you'll have, you know, increased customer loyalty, which helps retention. Um, you know, customer satisfaction rates helps, you know, with, with customers coming back, you can upsell and cross-sell them. I think that in most cases that it's, it's really, there's a strong correlation there, um, especially in, 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 in general retail. Um, I see, I work a lot with um, FSI, financial services institutions, and, um, and, and also telco companies. And, you know, if a customer leaves some of those type of sticky businesses, they don't really come back. You know, how many times do we change our banks? How many times do we change our mobile phones? So, you know, customer retention is, is really, really high. Um, but I'm going to throw a curveball out there a little bit. I think that there, there are some cases where there's, there's, the correlation is not as strong. Um, and I just have another experience, kind of opposite of, of Adam. I hope nobody gets offended in here, but I, I have some Scott. Scott had an opposite experience yesterday, too. <laughs> yeah, I had an opposite experience. My son just got his driver's license. And how many of you guys have ever gone to the DMV? And, um, and, and you know, whether, you, whether the, you have good customer satisfaction or not at the DMV, you're going to pay for that license. You're going to pay for your tag, right? So there's some... In some scenarios, uh, you know, whether it's, you know, government, monopolies, and things like that, you, there may not be as strong of a correlation with customer satisfaction and revenue, but I think that we're starting to see that change a little bit. Yeah. Two yeah. words that don't come into the same sentence, DMV and customer satisfaction. <laughs> <laughs> don't exactly have an association. That's interesting. We actually had one state reach out and did want to actually change that, and they wanted to be the gold standard of that. So I was <laughs> really great. happy that they were even thinking about that. So I don't think that ever went through, but I think they decided, you know, we don't actually have to be that great. <laughs> um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, to Adam's point and, and Joe's point, like you're not, you're not going to ever see a study that, you know, is going to tell you that that doesn't matter at all, right? I mean, I think that it's just an obvious thing that, um, you know, happy customers spend more money, that's going to lead to more revenue, right? We've each probably got anecdotal evidence of that in our own behaviors. Um, we actually just did a study um, at IBM. So I should have mentioned that in my intro, but Dialexa was acquired by IBM about 19 months ago, and we're helping build a product engineering practice there. Um, so just in case you saw the IBM sign and you were wondering what's that about. Um, but you know, we actually did this study, about 1,500 different uh, executives across the globe, and IBM's IBV, which is the Institute for Business Value, I think I've got that acronym right. Um, but we actually showed that uh, companies right now, the top performers in market, 
uh, prioritize customer loyalty right now above all, and that's across every industry pretty much. And you'd think like, okay, well, that's always you know the case. What's well, not? Literally a year ago, if you saw that, it was like one out of twelve. You know, was going to say that that was their top priority. Now, in the market cycle that we're in, the economy, that's really, really critical. And when you think about customer loyalty, we think about these ladders that you heard about earlier. Right, customer satisfaction leads to customer loyalty. It leads to increased revenue, but also it actually decreases cost. And we actually saw uh, in this study a margin lift. There was an ROI of about a 20-point difference between an average performer and a top performer for people who uh, prioritized and got customer loyalty really well. So, just mm-hmm. as an actual data point out there, it's super critical. Yeah, I probably have a little bit different take. I think. User satisfaction early stage matters paramount. It is the most important thing you can build towards. Like all the early products that we built, like we just built a session replay product and a new product called Listen. And we sort of make sure we, we do a survey after about 90 days in market. It's called product market fit survey, which is we ask that user, if we took this product out of your hand, how disappointed would you be? And we we benchmark all our teams had to get to 40% of the people have to say, we're very disappointed that if they were ripped out of your hands and we iterate until we get there. So I think early, when you're building early product, it really matters. The thing is you get bigger and you're at scale, I think it matters less. I think it's about value creation. Like you talked about a DMV, if there's value creation there, you're getting a driver license. So the user satisfaction doesn't have to be perfect at that point, right? You have scale. You, you just have to make sure that you're in a critical workflow or you're in a critical part of the business that if you're ripped out, it will hurt that business and not right. the user itself, but it's the entity of entirely. Like, how many of us use Alassian every day? The user experience is not the best, but you cannot rip it out of the engineering process today because it's so embedded. Mm-hmm. So, but early on, Alassian probably focused heavily on user um, satisfaction. So I think it varies at stages as well. Yeah. That's a very interesting thought, a timeline or even sort of a funnel around user satisfaction and where that needs to be at different points in the process. It, the, the question that you ask your users to gauge that as well, how disappointed would you be when that's taken away? Feels like a very honest question to be asking. Yeah. We've heard a lot today about the chasing growth. And I think, Scott, you've mentioned about companies that chased growth, you know, maybe are in difficult spots right now versus those doubling down. Yeah, I think that, uh, I think you make a really interesting point around some of these companies that are at scale or they're really embedded, they're sticky. Um, I think that is a luxury that, you know, comes with, I think, market traction, right? You know, I think every big company, you get so deeply ingrained in, in these businesses and you'd have high value creation over time that you get a lot more grace. Any of us who have built a company from the ground up know that it's like, we, we don't have that luxury. We're really easy to get rid of, really easy to kick out. Um, but yeah, that's, I think that, you know, companies that are, you know, your question around like the chasing growth, doubling down. I mean, I think that you know, I think what we're talking about here, if I understand the nature of your question right, which is, you know, people who are just chasing the top line versus optimizing for what they have and customer loyalty, doubling down on the customers they have. Is that your question? Yeah, and that yeah. dichotomy. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that, you know, there's been a huge trend. We get to see a lot of different businesses, you know, in consulting, and there's been a huge trend of people doubling down on the customers they do have and on our attention, reducing churn you know, extending that lifetime value of a customer. We're in a bull market of the past decade plus. It was just, you know, go, 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 go. And, you know, top line was what mattered. If we had a a little bit of a leaky bucket, not as big of a deal. I would guess everybody on this stage, like, you know, profitability, all of that has become a major trend and conversation at your business in a way that it probably wasn't in the five, 10 years before. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Let's... Or Joe, did you have something to add? Well, just a, just a couple of things. I mean, uh, working with professional services, we um, see the gambit of uh, implementations. Um, and uh, we have some customers that like to install um, our apps to monitor user experience on their, inter- on their internal apps, right? So I just talked with the gentleman earlier today that he was looking to monitor the internal, his internal apps um, that are only their internal 
you know, employee facing, mm -hmm. right? So there's not a lot of revenue driven from, the, from that, but there's like we talked about, like you guys talked about earlier, there's other value that you can get, right? So time saving. So, you know, we have maybe some customers that, uh, some internal customers that are trying to perform a certain action, um, like you mentioned, Alassians, um, you know, Adjusting that customer experience and, and making and having, having user satisfaction as a focus has other um, ways of increasing values. It reduces time, uh, increases employee satisfaction, which, which uh, helps with internal retention. So um, I don't think we could just, I think there's other facets to user satisfaction that's just not just, you know, kind of tied to revenue, but it's still very, very important in our UX and um, uh, UI design. And ladder up to that impact. I want to kind of turn this question on its head then about what happens when, or, or can you share some times that you may have seen when every effort was made to focus on user satisfaction, but it still failed for whatever reason. A relevant example at the moment might be Red Lobster, like we were talking about at the endless shrimp basket was the customer favorite, but has been cited as a reason that they're unfortunately going bankrupt. Have you seen that? And what were some of the lessons learned in cases like that? Yeah, I've brought that one up a little bit because it's sad to me. Like, it's a childhood story for me that I, I remember going to Red Lobster with my parents on Sunday afternoons. <laughs> I took my own kids, and we loved the endless shrimp. And they, like, they'd figured out back then offering it for a limited time was a, a way to, like, drum up the customers, get them excited. You're giving them a good product. It's something they'll come back for throughout the rest of the year and spend, you know, more on a higher margin item probably when they do that. And, and you know, at some point a couple of years ago, new leadership decided, well, let's just, you know, like, this is the thing that makes the customers happy and brings them in, so let's double down on this loss leader and make it a year-round thing and, uh, like, literally bankrupted the company. I'm sure there's, there's more factors at play to Red Lobster bankruptcy, but they mentioned that themselves in the Chapter 11, that this was a mistake. And uh, just an example how you can, you can go too far. Like, you do have to be careful and make sure, again, like, you're running a healthy business while you're doing it. Yeah. For us, I think... It's not a real failure, but we did a lot of learnings around this. So we give unlimited seats in our product. Because when we built the company in 2013, there was limited product managers inside of most businesses. So we wanted to virally grow. So we were like, just give unlimited licenses. The problem is you draw people into a product and they weren't onboarded. We didn't have onboarding. We didn't have self-service. We didn't build the product for self-service. So we learned people were churning out the product really fast because we were giving all these licenses away and all these seats away. That was great, first time use. But then they weren't coming back, and we would have to re-educate people every time they came back and about new features and things like that. So, and we built a whole community. We were like, OK, now we need a whole community that can re-educate other people as well. So sometimes it was about doing, we didn't think it through, basically. That was our biggest learning, like the side effects of opening up it to everybody. We're like, oh, this would be great. And then we realized the support volume, we needed self-service, we needed to make our tools easier, things like that. So we iterated on that over time as well. And it sounds like those learnings then shaped the future direction. Correct. A positive by prioritizing it, even if maybe not the immediate result you were looking for. Yeah, it helped us build our free product and do a lot of PLG stuff as well, because we learned how do we get a user in? How do we retrain the user as they come in? We do a role-based as well now, we so sort of personalize it if you're an engineer coming in versus product manager or product marketing person. So we've learned over time over the last 10 years. Hey. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's the nature of product, right, is you're going to test things. So you could look at it as like some of these things we didn't try or, you know, they failed. That should be part of it, right? That's just not, failure is never the objective, but it's just part of the process, right? You're testing and learning. That's what you want to happen, right? I mean, I think what we've seen... Uh, you know, both product companies we have spun out. We've seen everything from, you know, call like technological failures, supply chain failures. I mean, you know, just not thinking through the whole like suite of things that's going to be needed to make that customer successful in the market. But I think the number one thing that, that happens whenever we've seen failures, either that, you know, our clients take something to market or we have, it's just, it's not thinking from the customer backward and working yourself backwards, right? I think like if you want to really simplify it, like if you've got to think from that customer experience starting there and that value you're trying to create, work backwards into everything you're doing to support that. I think especially with large companies, it 
it's really easy to get caught up in all the internal things and complexities and your ideas and the other things that you've got going on in the business strategy and kind of back burnering that customer side of things, which is really what matters most in terms of getting that traction. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was going to, along the same lines, I, I have a kind of a personal funny story. Um, you know, you know, just making assumptions about what the customer wants, uh, what they need, um, can can be kind of can be kind of dangerous. You know, I, I like what Earl was saying in terms of like iteration over what you've learned and kind of grow from there. Um, and a funny story, it's not necessarily a, a technical product, but way back in the day, my my I was throwing, we were throwing a, a birthday party for my wife, right? And my wife does not like surprises, but I didn't know that. I thought that I know this, I'm going to make the best party ever. We're going to throw a lot of money at it. She's going to love it, you know, get all these people that she may not know and surprise, you know. Um, and so, so we, we held this party and it was the worst customer experience or user experience yeah. of all time. We literally... I literally almost had a customer churn because of that. <laughs> so, so, so then we, I iterated and I learned from, you know, from that experience and took the right amount of data, you know, learned from what do you really like, what is it, and then tested it. And now we have great birthday parties. You know, all she wants to do is sit down, relax, be served by our kids and things like that, get flowers and we're good to go. But those are some of the things that we can apply you know, to our to our day to day products as well. You know, a lot of times we make assumptions. We throw a lot of money at the problem, think that we can solve it, and it's like this. The customer is like, "This is not what I want. This is not the experience that I want." So, understanding that, like I said, not making assumptions, get looking at it from the customer perspective. That um, it helps save a lot of money. It helps you know drive customer satisfaction. Yeah, I think one. You know, the just to tag onto this, you know, in the enterprise theme here that I'm obviously going to be you know primarily focused on is. I think just even this like test, learn, iterate mentality, if you put it out there, you learn from that. I think one thing that you see in a lot of large companies is they think the heavy lift is like actually building something, getting it to market, which you've got to do that. You got to do it well. You've got to do research well. You've got to get a good product to market, but then you can't like go put it in maintenance mode right there. That's where you really start learning and you actually have to make it deliver some kind of business result. That's not, you know, it's not done once you, you know, once you just delivered the initial thing. That's something that is really a forgotten or just not ever even learned type of skill or mentality in large companies, not nearly enough. Yeah, yeah. So to this idea of avoided churn, <laughs> best metaphor ever for that party, um, who else do we need to bring into that process? Because it's likely going to be more than product alone that needs to shape that. So can we talk a little bit about the teams involved in driving that satisfaction? Yeah, I, I feel like it needs to be all, all teams. So like if, you, if you're in a silo of product and you're thinking about customer satisfaction, but everyone else's priorities are in different areas, then like you're eventually going to fail or you're not going to have the desired result. Um, and I think both sides, if you will, like thinking about this room as product and other sides of the company, they need to be more single-minded. So, you know, business folks, they tend to think about bottom line, not necessarily always thinking every day about, you know, the product that I'm building and satisfying the customer. They need to realize that's a, a means to an end and the end is their, their revenue growth that they want. And then for this room, um, and I'm one of you, so if I say something that like it pokes you a little bit, I'm one of you, so I'm saying this about myself too. We can sometimes be a little bit, um, like we, we can get our heads in the clouds sometimes in an R&D organization. And I heard, I heard you both saying it about like, we make assumptions and we come up with ideas of what the product should be. And we also need to think about the bottom line in product as well too, because we're, so we need to meet the business in the middle and understand I'm creating a product for the purpose of building a healthy company and, and serving the end user. And I think when everyone comes together and you can prioritize the things you should work on and you should drive results for the customer for the purpose of building a great business, then you're all like-minded and, you know, to use the old cliche, you're rowing in the same direction. But I think that really does mean something when you're trying to drive an effort like this. Yeah. I I think churn ends up being like a go-to-market issue, but it is really a product engineering issue as well. And they need to be heavily involved. Like what we do is, two things we've done is put customer support back into engineering. So the engineers know the pain of the products they're building and the support cost of it. 
Also, early on, all our products, we opened up personal Slack channels, basically with our first 30 customers. So our engineers can see, hey, the code they're building, is it driving value? How can I iterate faster? So really, I think churn is making sure your, your engineering team and your product team understand what value creation means for that end customer. Because I think a lot of times you will hear, oh, this is a go-to-market issue. You know, customer success will deal with it. Yeah. But it really boils down to, is the product providing value? And how can the engineering and product team help drive that value faster? And whether that's, you know, product marketing, customer success, sales, enablement, sort of anchoring everybody in, this is why this is important. This is what this is going to do for all of us and how to be ambassadors of the message feels really core to that too. Absolutely. Correct. So then the theme of the day, we have to ask about AI and what role for you all that you have observed does this play in user satisfaction? How can product teams leverage it, AI, ML, to personalize these user experiences? Yeah, well, for me, um, in my experience, um, you know, I have to look, I have to look at, you know, you know, what drives user satisfaction, right? So the path to user satisfaction begins with understanding the user's experience, right? And the, the path to understanding the user's experience is data. You know, you have to understand the user's struggles, the user's interactions, the user's feedback uh, from surveys. Taking all of that data and under getting insights from it, identifying patterns, kind of, you know, removing biases uh, from that data is where AI plays a huge factor. Um, I kind of look at the, think of an analogy of um, putting three guys in a room and blindfolding them um, and then you know putting them in a room with an elephant right and asking them to describe what that object is in the room right so the first guy goes and says hey this is a fire hose because he's touching the trunk and the second guy goes in and say no this is a tree trunk because he's touching the leg and the third guy's like no this is a snake because he's touching the uh the tail and then they take the the blindfolds off and then they see the bigger picture um as opposed to the kind of myopic view based on you know their perspective their, their experience and i see this in the real world as well like we have you know, we have our customers that are doing these surveys and they're saying, well, our customer is, you know, angry about this thing because the survey says this, you know, when really with the surveys, it's only it's a small percentage of people. Those are only, only your vocal people, right? The people that actually respond to the surveys. Um, with Glassbox, we have this AI component that does what's called the voice of the silent. So those silent sufferers that didn't fill out the surveys, you want to capture that information too. So we take the uh, voice of the customer, we say we use AI to understand the patterns of those experiences, those bad or good experiences, and then we use AI to map that across your whole um, your population of users to kind of to understand what, you know, what's the broader sentiment. Uh, behind these, uh, these, these questions and these issues that they're facing. So AI definitely has a place. Uh, it helps you, again, see the big picture. Um, and I think it has a really good uh, place in, in, in helping with uh, user satisfaction. Any other thoughts? I think for us, AI is going to be a lot about the personalization. You see it in B2C today. It will become B2B. What you see on Netflix, everything is personalized to you. I think B2B software over the next five to ten years will be very personalized. You come to Salesforce, it'll know if you're an admin or if you're doing an opportunity, it'll know all those things. But the thing that we focus on it around AI is the design of it, right? You can't, when we think about AI, how do we make it more of a helper than taking over somebody's job, right? Like we have products that sort of summarize all the feedback that you get from your customer base or your user base, but we let them edit it. And so it's not only what the computer told them, but they can edit it and say, no, this doesn't sound right, right? So allowing escape hatches for the human to actually interact with the AI is going to be really the key and how it's designed into the products. Makes sense. I think, I mean, you, you probably can't, you know, if you watch TV at all, you've probably seen Watson X commercials and all that. You know, that's just a huge thing at IBM. It's the thing they're really focused on is providing this building, this platform for artificial intelligence and um, especially their most recent Gen AI. They think that we're going to have models across, you know, a, a myriad of business use cases, different models for different things, specialized models. They're going to need this, you know, singular place to live and interact. Customer experience is a huge part of that. You know, on the services side, I mean, we have a, a large telco client, for example, where we have done an engagement where we've 
synthesize all of their chats, right? Their customer service chats, for example, to extract, you know, sentiment analysis out of that and extracting ideas of just, you know, what are our top five biggest problems and what do we need to do about that, right? You can just start like really rapidly getting ideas of, you know, how to address your shortcomings on your experiences with your customers. So that's something that, you know, would have taken a very long time in the past. I think we all know on the experience side for customers, your speed to response and speed to resolution is absolutely critical. So if people are really having frustration with your product, getting it fixed quickly is really, really critical and it's going to rapidly accelerate that. And then obviously on the hyper personalization front, that's, you know, a huge trend in generative AI. I think if, if you haven't, if anybody out here has not gone and looked at like what's happening around like dynamic user interfaces, mm -hmm. it's not just saying, you know, Hey Scott, welcome back. Oh, they know it's me. Mm -hmm. It's actually giving you a custom interface yeah. and adapting that. That's definitely going to be a big part of the future is knowing how I like to work, how I like to interact. That probably will come you know, with all these products these guys are building as well. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, just on the summarizing of chats or feedback, I think the other thing people want is transparency, yeah. right? They want to double click on, you analyze these thousands of pieces of feedback. I want to double click on it to verify it, right? And make sure there's no hallucination. I want to actually see the evidence. So you're going to see a lot more data as well built into it because people are going to be like, it sounds really good. Is it true or not? So a lot of that's going to be coming into a lot of how software is built is providing that transparency. How did you build that summary? How did you gather that information? There's models, testing models, traceability. Traceability, yeah. 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 yeah and we mentioned the value behind the product. I think a lot of the value behind uh, Gen AI use cases is coming down to time savings mm. initially. At least that's the first, like, uh, that, that's the place where a lot of us are going to start by saving our customers' time. And, um, you know, personalization is one. And, um, but I, I think, there's just such a such an opportunity when it comes to giving the customers something valuable is save just saving their time something they used to spend uh, hours doing this is the way we've approached it in quantum is find the parts of our product that someone was spending hours doing the same thing over and over and over again narrow those down aggregate them up and then turn that into a, an automated process through gen ai and i think that's just a, a good starting point if you're still looking for where can our product kind of start to dip its toes into the Gen AI space? Mm. Yeah. Well, we're almost out of time. So I think to, to take us home here, if you had to sum up your thoughts on this topic, especially around the question of how to monetize all of this, what would be the one parting thought you'd leave us with? Yeah, uh, someone asked me about my, my career trajectory earlier, and I was talking about how I moved from an engineer to more leading an R&D organization. And um, another shift that happened in my career the last seven years um, was just kind of picking my head up out of R&D and looking at the other parts of the company and, and what's important to them. And a lot of them, it's, it's revenue driven. You know, when you think about sales and marketing, they care about the bottom line of the company. So for, for all of you who are also here thinking about your own career trajectory, you want to progress and move forward. I would, I would highly suggest you talk to others around the company, figure out what's important in their roles. What does success mean to them? And then figure out how in your role, you can help them succeed in theirs. And I think it's just a way to, to really broaden your horizon. And this revenue topic is one that if you're typically in product, it's, it's kind of like product 301 for me. You think about building first, and then you start thinking about revenue driving after that. But a really good way to make your career take off. You know, just a couple of things for me, just a quick closing thoughts. I think uh, we talked about this earlier, who is involved in help rep driving revenue. I think it has to be kind of a top-down approach and also a horizontal approach across the company. Um, I think Roel made, made a good point about, you know, a lot of times we'll see, you know, R&D or developers are saying, hey, that's, that's not my problem or it's customer success's problem to deal with customer user satisfaction. Well, everybody is involved and everybody has to be involved in, in driving customer satisfaction and user satisfaction for your, for your customers. Um, you're all one team, you know, um, so that it makes, it makes a huge, huge difference. I mean, you know, talk to Michael Jordan, you know, he's all-star player, but he still had to have a team supporting him and driving for that goal of, um, of, of winning the prize. And the prize in this case is, is user satisfaction, so. Yeah, I think um, 
not to pile on here, but I think what we're talking about, all of this just monetization is going to come, you know, from different things, depending on what you're doing, which, you know, which industry you're in, which product you're building or you're selling to. But I do think ingraining culturally that product mindset, that holistic mindset across all the teams to understand that we all have, you know, the same objective. Like if you don't look at it that way, whether it's monetization, top line growth, bottom line optimization, you know, reducing churn, whatever it is, like you're, you're not going to be terribly successful. You're just going to be spinning your wheels. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah. My only advice is if you want to drive top line growth, make sure you can put a stopwatch down and in five minutes, they can see value creation or an aha moment. If they can do that in five minutes of their product, you can drive top line growth and they'll be satisfied because that's what we sort of work on. Number of clicks to get the value creation. How do you get to that aha moment? And really, you know, we, we push our team, like, put a watch, it's five minutes, can I see some value creation? And you can drive top, top line growth usually. Love that, run the stopwatch. Well, thank you so much to our panel. Thank you to all of you for the great discussion. Really appreciate it. You all have booths for your companies in the Expo Hall, so definitely check them out and feel free to connect with these guys on LinkedIn. But thank you again. Thank you, guys. Thank you. It's fine. <laughs>